For both teams, most of the first quarter consisted of short advancement ruined by equal and opposite setbacks. Jeff Kinney rumbled for nine yards on the Chiefs' first play from scrimmage, but the promising beginning ended with a sack of Mike Livingston by Lyle Alzado and Barney Chavis. So the Chiefs' first possession began on a forward note and ended on a backward one. But it was not as bad as Denver's first thrust when Haven Moses got a 14-yard reception but lost the ball. Looking at the play from another angle reveals that number 40, Jim Marsalis, picked Moses' pocket clean as he cut across the middle. Jim Kearney recovered and the Chiefs were in good shape near midfield. This is not the last you'll hear of the Moses Marsalis bout, but for now, Moses was greatly disheartened by losing the first round of their duel. No amount of cheering by members of the Bronco defense would give Haven a haven. What did cheer him up was the fact that the Denver defenders poured in on Livingston again, squashing Kansas City's second possession. A great play by Willie Lanier helped stifle Denver's second possession. All the Chiefs are greatly hardened by the fact that Lanier, number 63, backed off his announced retirement last season. All but the last minute of the first period was pretty much a punting duel, with Gerald Wilson, number 44, doing his best to provide a little excitement, hitting this one while on the run, yet still getting it out of the end zone 50 yards away. But then the fun began, although it appeared the game was continuing on its up and back course. A nice pass to Ed Podolak was wiped out by a penalty. And on a repeat, watch the second chief from the left, Charlie Getty, get a piece of John Grant with his right hand. So another advancement had been reversed, this time by a penalty. But from this moment on, the game would drop the rags from its rags to riches storyline. On the very next play, Mike Livingston hit rookie Walter White with a perfect pass over John Pitts. Sixty-nine yards later, the rookie tight end from Maryland scored his first pro touchdown. What had started out as a game of errors had its first home run, a 69-yarder, and there were lots more to come. The Chiefs now led 7 to nothing. Though the Chiefs at last had shaken the opening day jitters, the Broncos could not yet get rid of theirs. The next series proved that. On first down, Charlie Johnson was sacked for minus 8. On second down, Oliver Ross, number 30, lost two more yards and nearly coughed up the ball thanks to a nice play by William Peterson. On the last two plays of the first quarter, Denver had moved backward 10 yards and nearly committed a turnover. Then on the first play of the second quarter, they did, when Johnson hit chief cornerback Emmett Thomas dead in stride. Thomas paid for his larceny, but his interception gave Kansas City the ball on the Denver 21, and Livingston almost made it pay off big. Big play Otis Taylor came up short this time, and the Chiefs settled for a field goal to lead 10 to nothing. Having gotten off four points cheaper, the Broncos at last began to move. Repeating this Oliver Ross run reveals that he carries the ball like the proverbial loaf of bread. It had almost cost him once before, and one play later, it almost did again. Now back to Marsalis and Moses. On the next play, Johnson tried for Moses on the near sideline 
got a break when Marsalis was called for interference. Then after sandwiching in a run, Johnson coolly avoided the rush, stepped up in the pocket, and hit Moses heading toward the far sideline with Marsalis in futile hot pursuit. Moses was making Marsalis pay for his pocket picking act in the first quarter. Finally from the 13, Johnson stopped picking on the pickpocket and Denver was on the board with a nifty reverse. Rookie Rick Upchurch, who apparently hasn't been with Denver long enough to earn his helmet stripes or Denver D's for the sides of his helmet, joined Chief Rookie Walter White by also scoring his first pro touchdown. And Denver now trailed by just three points. Now it was the Chiefs' turn to stumble when an innocent-looking four-yard out was turned into a fumble. Number 84, former Bronco Billy Masters fumbled and John Grant staggered to the Chief 28. Looking at the play from ground level reveals that there was no excuse for Masters' bobble. Number 46, John Rouser, really didn't stick him that hard. The repeat also reveals a seldom called penalty as members of the Bronco defense illegally aided Grant downfield and Denver was forced to start from outside the 40 instead of inside the 30-yard line. It didn't much matter, though, as Johnson soon thereafter spotted Jack Dolben cutting across the middle. Denver now led for the first time in the game 14-10. Suddenly behind, the Chiefs now got back in gear with a 70-yard drive that was almost totally ground-oriented. Only eight yards would come by the pass. Just to keep his hand in the pot, Livingston did contribute the longest run of the drive, a 28-yard scamper around right end. Having now gone 67 of the 70 yards with only five yards acquired through the air, Livingston went up top for the last three yards in the touch. Looking at the play again, notice that number 45, Jeff Severson, was in a safety blitz. It might have worked had he not been drawn toward Jeff Kinney thanks to a good play-action fake. Because of it, he did not get to Livingston in time, and Woody Green's reception put Kansas City back on top, 17 to 14, with two and a half minutes left in the half. But now that they were warmed up, two and a half minutes was plenty of time to get on the board again. For the first time, 1973 rushing champ Otis Armstrong broke free to ignite the drive, Johnson then aired it out for Riley Odoms, one of the best tight ends in pro football, who had also been curiously silent. The play gained 43 yards, then it was back to Haven Moses for 19 yards, though he paid dearly. Denver's drive was blunted when Wilbur Young, number 99, picked himself up and dusted Johnson off for the third time in the half. Denver was forced to settle for a field goal to tie the game at 17. 34 points have been scored in the last 16 minutes of the first half. At the start of the second half, Denver wasted no time in breaking the tie when Charlie Johnson let fly a 90-yard touchdown bomb to Rick Upchurch, who by this time had earned his Denver decal. The stunning play by the jubilant rookie put the Broncos back in front by seven points. Another look at this 90-yard beauty shows Johnson just reared back and put everything he had on the ball. 
Upchurch used his blazing speed and an old-fashioned stiff arm to do the rest. Bronco's fourth round draft choice from Minnesota was a running back in college, but it appears that John Ralston has found the right spot for him in the pros. Trailing by seven now, Mike Livingston of the Chiefs came right back with a bit of razzle-dazzle of their own. Receiver Barry Pearson and his pigeon on the play, number 46, John Rouser, were once teammates with the Steelers. But those days are obviously gone for good. Another look at the play shows the chronology. Went Livingston to Green to Brunson to Livingston to Pearson. The result, 45 yards and the ball on the Denver 20. plays later, Mike Livingston overthrew Pearson, who made like the proverbial dying swan. Despite his claim of a late hit, the officials ignored his histrionics. However, a 34-yard field goal by Jan Stenerud helped ease Pearson's pain and put the Chiefs within four of the Broncos. Stenerud again contributed, but on the very next play, his bouncing kickoff touched Carl Shokowicz and was recovered on the Denver 25 by Reggie Craig. Several plays later, Woody Green followed Jeff Kinney into the end zone for his second touchdown, and Kansas City regained the lead 27-24. In this crazy quilt game of big plays and big mistakes, Otis Armstrong made both on the first play of the next series. Jimmy Marsalis' recovery gave his team their third straight crack at the Broncos' goal from in close. Although Barry Pearson made a fine catch at the left sideline for one first down, Ed Podolak was stopped short three plays later, and again Stenerud was called upon to do what he does so very well. From 45 yards away, the nine-year veteran from Montana State increased his team's lead to 30 to 24. What had been a seesaw battle was very definitely tipping toward a Chiefs victory. Three plays after Stenerud's field goal, Charlie Johnson with fine protection, nevertheless put the ball up for grabs, and Mike Sensabaugh came up with it for an interception. Though they were again given a gift deep in enemy territory, Kansas City again settled for a field goal and a nine-point advantage. 
From an out-of-customs spot on the sidelines, Lenny Dawson had seen his replacement put points on the board the first four times the Chiefs had possession in the second half. Down by nine in the final quarter, Charlie Johnson again went to rookie Rick Upchurch in a tight situation. And again, Upchurch came through. His 33-yard catch put the Broncos at the Chief 36. And two plays later, Otis Armstrong broke free. Though he lost the ball at the two, Jack Dolben took it in for the touchdown. While Dolben, who last year played in the WFL, was being congratulated, the disconsolate Armstrong was being informed that his team had indeed scored despite his fumble. The extra point was blocked, so the Broncos were now three behind. The momentum was once again Denver's, and on the next series, their defense kept it flowing with fierce pursuit and gang tackling that forced the Chiefs to punt. Though Gerald Wilson got off a fine kick, his mistake was kicking to the ubiquitous Mr. Upchurch. The results are by now predictable. A few plays later, Johnson again found Upchurch for big yardage and the Broncos were on the threshold of another score. With less than two minutes to go in the game, Billy Van Heusen's tiptoe in the end zone put the Broncos ahead for the last time. And joy reigned on the Bronco bench. Charlie Johnson had to complete a difficult pass in a crucial situation, and he laid the ball right into Van Heusen's hands for the go-ahead touchdown. It capped a remarkable day for the usually run-oriented Broncos. They totaled well over 400 yards gained, 329 of it by the air lanes. More importantly, they had taken a four-point lead over Kansas City with just over a minute remaining. The entire Bronco team was mile high by the sudden turn of events. New coach Paul Wigan watched his charges gear up for one last attempt at victory. But number 77, Lyle Alzado, made the defensive play of the day as he both caused and recovered Livingston's fumble. The last Kansas City threat was over, and Alzado and his teammates celebrated with the abandon for which John Ralston's teams are noted. For new coach Wigan, it was a difficult defeat to digest because his team, particularly the offense, had played so well. But in the end, four points separated the victor and the vanquished, and on this first Sunday in the NFL, the Denver Broncos sent their fans home satisfied. They had seen one whale of a football game. <laughs>